Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Now, earlier in the week, I had the privilege to visit this place. This is part of the NASA Ames Research Center at Moffett Field. You can see the giant airship hangar in the background, which is currently being refurbished. Uh, the building itself is actually an old McDonald's restaurant, which uh, used to serve the base. There's a little skull and crossbones flag flying in the window, and next to it, you might be able to see a Titan missile. Anyway, inside, it is full of old uh, technology, old gear, and a bunch of space scientists who are trying to recover old data from old uh, NASA projects. I like to think of these guys as space archaeologists, digging into the past and preserving f stuff for the future. Now, their current project has a very limited time window, and they are looking for some crowdfunding for it, so I thought I'd bring them on to my little uh, channel and talk to them. Hello again! It's uh, Austin? Yes. Yes, Austin. Uh, I talked to her a few minutes ago about recovering old lunar images, but you have a bold plan. Well, you and your friends have a bold plan to recover something more tangible, I'd say. Right. So the uh, the spacecraft, ISEE-3, was launched in 1978. It was a, uh, a solar physics spacecraft. Uh, it was placed at the Earth-Sun Lagrange point, which is a, a stable point in space between uh, the Earth and the Sun, where the gravitational uh, fields are, are sort of out of balance with one another. And uh, in the 80s, someone uh, named Bob Farquhar came up with this idea to uh, take the spacecraft and go uh, intercept a comet. Uh, Ge I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Giacobini Zinner. Giacobini Zinner. Zimmer, yes. Anyway. <laughs> uh, the uh, the spacecraft was used to go intercept this uh, this comet, and they flew through the the comma and the tail of the the comet. In uh, and we love the data that it gave, but it absolutely, like. uh, they also uh, flew it upstream of Halley's comet, and uh, they were able to uh, capture uh, data on the, um, the the solar the solar wind that was the, hitting the comet exactly and, upstream of the right of the comet. Because there were other satellites going through the coma and through its tail. Everybody was studying that, and that this was just a cheap way for NASA to get in on the on the right. Fun. And it was it was the way to be the first to uh, intercept a comet. Uh, it, was, ah. it was able to uh, because NASA didn't have a, a dedicated mission to uh, Halley's comet like the um, the Russians had and the Japanese had, and I believe and the Europeans ESA, had a Giotto. ESA, yeah, uh, they were able to. Uh, snatch victory from the jaws of defeat on um, being the first uh, space program to intercept a, a comet with uh, with a spacecraft that was never designed to do that. It was designed to monitor the solar wind, essentially, right? Right. And amongst other things, it looked at plasma and particle flux and things yeah. like that. It also uh, spent quite a bit of time in the Earth's geomagnetic uh, tail. Mm -hmm. uh, they they had some very interesting orbits. Uh, they they did a total of five lunar swingbys, uh, the last of which sent it on its. Uh, present trajectory. And, and let's be clear, this spacecraft was not really designed for this mission. It just happened that someone that really knew his orbital mechanics and knew how to deal with multi-body problems came up with a way to move the or this spacecraft off using a very small amount of delta V, right? That this is, is absolutely correct. It's uh, what we call weak stability boundaries or something, again. Yeah, and that, that was all uh, Bob Farquhar, who uh, he, he came up with all of this stuff in the in the eighties. Okay, and so that was in the eighties. Now thirty years on, where is it? So it's it's heading back to Earth. It's going. It was, um, you know, the original plan was that they wanted a uh, leading edge lunar swing by to occur on August 10, 2014, and uh, that's where it's heading right now. Uh, the last. Uh, good ranging that was done on the spacecraft was in the uh, late 1990s and uh, we know fairly well where it's heading uh, we need to if we want to actually capture this and do a useful orbit and there are several uh, candidate orbits that we would uh, be able to capture this into we need to be able to fire the thrusters within the next uh, six or eight weeks uh, in order to have any uh, fuel remaining on board after the, uh, the maneuvers performed. 
So I read that it has about 150 meters per second of delta V left, they reckon? Yeah, about and 150 uh, meters per second left, and they suspect, if we could do the maneuver right now, it would take about 30 meters per second. Uh, if we can do the meet, uh, maneuver within about the next eight weeks, you know, you're talking about 60 meters per second, things start to go up very drastically. And what's the cutoff date? It's looking like sometime in, in mid-July is, okay. is really the So date. why don't we just make it do that? Because it seems like doing it early would be a good idea. Well, in the uh, late 90s, uh, the Deep Space Network uh, of NASA retired a lot of old equipment. And among the equipment that was retired was the uh, all of the equipment required to talk to this oh, spacecraft. Oh dear, what, a, what an oversight that was! Well, there, was, uh, there wasn't a lot of thought given to uh, a spacecraft that was as old as it, this one was, and uh, the 2014 capture date was still quite a ways in the future. So, uh, fortunately, the pace of technology has allowed uh, things like software radio to have the capability of, of doing this on a very tight timeline and uh, low budget because you can prototype things out uh, in software radio without actually touching hardware at all. You, you basically have a, a box that connects to your computer via USB or Ethernet. Uh, you set up all the parameters of the radio on the computer and everything gets, uh, gets managed by the CPU. So you don't need to build 70s hardware. It's not like the tape, the Lunar Project. This right. is something you can do it in software. You can find yourself an antenna, talk to the spacecraft, and hopefully capture it. Yeah, so uh, the first step is going to be trying to get uh, ranging information to the spacecraft. We also need to determine the status of the, the spacecraft. Uh, the format of the telemetry is very well documented. Uh, we just need to uh, get an antenna that has the, the gain to be able to uh, turn the spacecraft on, essentially. It's, it's right now sending a, just a, a carrier with no information on it. We need it to start sending uh, engineering telemetry back so that we can uh, look at that and find out whether the spacecraft is going to even be able to uh, perform a burn. And once we confirm that, we need to plan a series of uh, of thruster firings to put it on a trajectory that uh, allows it to be captured. Okay, so this uh, the, the plan basically is uh, being promoted through your Rocket Hub page, right? right. So Which I can see in the background. We are, we so are this trying. Is, while, while we're at it, right? We we're are trying to raise $125,000 to do the, uh, the initial work on, on this mission. Uh, we've, we're almost at $90,000 right now, so we're getting pretty close. A lot of good people that Absolutely. want this thing to be returned. Absolutely. I, it's it's and gotten a, a phenomenal level of support, and it's been almost all through Reddit and Slashdot and mm -hmm. very little mainstream It's the little media space coverage. probe that could, right? Exactly, it's, yeah. Everyone wants this little plucky thing. I, didn't they, they actually tell it to turn itself off? They... they told it to turn off its uh, telemetry. It's, it's sending only... Oh, it's sending a carrier. Okay. Only carrier right now, and they used that in the um, in the 90s, and I think even in the in the 2000s, to study uh, the effects of the solar wind on the spacecraft mm -hmm. just by uh, watching this carrier. Okay, so they did track it and was provided fascinating information on how it was pushing the spacecraft around and everything, I imagine. Exactly. But so not only do you have to build the transmitter, you have to come up with a way to emulate or the spacecraft itself to make sure that what you transmit to it makes sense. Right. So before we send any commands to start uh, start firing thrusters, we need to confirm that those uh, commands are going to actually put us in the uh, orbit that we want to be put into. And all of the software that was used during the 1980s to uh, plan those maneuvers is uh, this deprecated software. Uh, whether or not it exists at all, uh, we're still trying to determine, but... Well, if, if anybody's listening that has a copy, by the way, you know, they yeah. could really use it. I Iceman and, uh, <laughs> and uh, Flash, I think, were the... Iceman and Flash, were, what great names. Yeah. 
Maybe, maybe Val Kilmer's got a, a copy of it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you've got 12 days left on this at this point, and uh, yeah. we really want to make it through that uh, goal. So uh, once you've got it, you, the idea is to put it onto some sort of captured orbit where you can then, you'll have your own satellite, right? Essentially, yeah. We're going to be, um, you know, the, the very initial plan is to get only the engineering telemetry, uh, things that are directly related to spacecraft health. But once it's in its orbit, we can put it back into its uh, normal mode, which is uh, sending scientific data from all of its instruments uh, that are still working, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I think nine of the original instruments are still working aboard the spacecraft, yeah. and some of them are actually unique. They don't have any uh, current analog in, in orbit. Uh, so we could, you know, it, it still is a capable spacecraft. And uh, the other thing I guess I want to ask is, you, you say it's only going to take like, you know, say on the order of 50 meters per second of delta V. How, how, how do you capture something with such a tiny amount of delta V, given the, you know, things in space are generally much bigger than that, I guess. Well, uh, that is where uh, orbital mechanics uh, gurus like Bob Farquhar, who's involved in our project. So did he come up with the orbit or one of many or? He, there are still several candidate orbits. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob Farquhar, uh, Mike Laux, who uh, did the Laddie mission recently. Mm -hmm. uh, there are others involved um, who are working on this right now. and. Uh, Kinetics mm -hmm. is the, the firm that uh, is doing some of this work. And they, uh, essentially with the, the lunar swing by, uh, we can put it at the, the state it needs you to be into. To and how close do you have to be? I mean, what is, this is presumably a rather chaotic uh, out orbit. So what's, how big is the keyhole you have to hit? I think it's about a hundred kilometer keyhole the last time I heard. A hundred kilometers, like from uh, oh, the the window is about a hundred kilometers. It's uh, it's it's all uh, formatted in, in lunar radius, so I'm not sure how high above the the surface it is, but uh, it's it's pretty low. Okay. Uh, it's between I want to say eighteen hundred and nineteen hundred kilometers from uh, the lunar centroid. So, I mean, that, that seems to me to represent probably some, you know, serious navigation to get that close after 30 years. I mean, Voyager hit some small keyholes on the way out, but it wasn't going for 30 years, you know, after... That's right. So that's, <laughs> that's one of the big reasons that we need to be able to do this, this burn soon, and, and uh, we'll be able to do correction burns right. once we take out the bulk of that Delta V and we can range to the spacecraft. Uh, you know, perform fine corrections as, as needed uh, to hit the keyhole that it needs to hit. And uh, there's there's several orbits that we've uh, discussed putting into. One of them is uh, is a distant distant retrograde orbit, which is the same orbit that uh, uh, NASA has discussed putting a uh, captured asteroid. Oh yeah. Into yes. Uh, there are some uh, resonant orbits. Uh, we probably won't be able to get the apogee uh, low enough that it won't. Uh, be affected by uh, the moon, so uh, right. I mean, if you're it. putting in to orbit through a close encounter with the moon, then you will always have the potential for a close encounter with the moon, unless you manage your orbit a little. Mm -hmm. you know, there, and, there, and there will need to be uh, at least one burn. Uh, I, uh, last I heard, within four months of the the flyby, uh, to put us into a, a stable, a somewhat orbit. stable parking orbit. <laughs> Okay, so that is that's everything. That's ISEE. That is the uh, that is the ISEE three uh, reboot I, project. I found this on the desk. This is the original launch plan. Of right. Some stuff. <laughs> like I'm such a nerd here. This is this is me, Scott Manley, saying you should totally back this project because it's cool. It's so nerdy. It covers. Um, it's like space archaeology. It's covering. Uh, you know, cool orbital mechanics and, you know, it's technology. It's everything. I love this stuff. <laughs> so, yeah, ISEE 3? ISEE 3 Reboot IS Project. ISEE 3 Reboot Project on Rocket Hub. Uh, get over there. Give them your money. Give them your praise. Fly safe, guys.